I just want to run through a few notes that I've taken during the course of today just to, to reinforce a few things uh, and bring us back to, to why we started off here today is talking about the EU Green Deal. So um, I think the, the first thing I want to share is some of the key points I took out of Samira's uh, presentation to us uh, who opened up our, our session. Uh, and I think some of the key points there are African farmers need to do more and we need to do it together. Uh, we've heard that numerous times. We need to get one voice going up to the European Union uh, and the African Union uh, expressing the concerns we have. Um, Almay, we're very happy to hear that your, 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 recent, your last comment about um, maybe crop life playing a facilitatory role because we had the same from Samira in the beginning. She's volunteered that she's there with her organization to assist Crop Life South Africa uh, in uh, taking these messages uh, uh, up the line. You also heard uh, Samira talking about the green transition for Africa. It, it might have slipped under the radar, but this is really a, a first step. If the European Union can want to have it, why can't Africa? And it's a, it's a very noble cause, and this is one of the first you're going to hear about it from CropLife about the uh, green transition for, for Africa. Uh, I think the next point, if I don't go all the way to the end of my notes, sorry for that. Um, we had Dr. Matthews. I thought um, his overview of the EU Green Deal and the various parts was excellent. <clears throat> Remember, he told us he's got the three platforms to it, the environmental, the economic, and the social. Uh, also highlighted that there are multiple other uh, EU uh, regulations and legislation that are going to have an impact. And he introduced to us the, the, the mirror clause uh, uh, concept. And he's also introduced that there the concept that there could be both positive and negative uh, impacts of the Green Deal. Uh, Dr. Davids from, from BFAP gave us some great data as to how important the European Union is for our export farmers. Uh, and for me, that just shows we have to take a stand. We have to have some form of action uh, going back up because of the importance of uh, the EU as a trading partner. Uh, and Tracy also highlighted again that there will be opportunities. Just the challenge is will we be able to uh, navigate the regulatory hurdles to take advantage of those, uh, those challenges. Um, then Vibka uh, spoke to us about the MRLs. Uh, for me, the key to take out of this is the objection that's already been made of linking environmental factors to the setting of MRLs. Environmental factors are already taken into account when the active ingredient uh, is analyzed or assessed, and also when the formulated product is assessed. So, so why does the EU want to link those together? Uh, I think that's important. Uh, the bit that I tried to highlight in, in my presentation, I think is, is also where Lindy's been highlighting, is yes, our primary focus of today and, and going forward has been the EU Green Deal, but let's not forget that there are other regulatory hurdles that we already have. EU Green Deal is just going to exasperate other challenges we have, but we do need to take into account that there are other uh, internal, external uh, regulatory influences. The second session we had today uh, was, um, again, led us into it with, uh, with looking at uh, other regulatory challenges. It was Sara with the um, update from the fantastic work that she and the working group have been doing on the 1As and 1Bs. I think you all know where we are now in the process and uh, grower associations as well as CropLife South Africa members have received the, the updates as to where we are and we will keep everybody posted going forward. Uh, Prof. Juster gave a pretty good overview there, I thought, of uh, potential economic as aspects of policies that they can have on, on agriculture. Uh, but a key takeaway for me is something we discussed at our EXCO yesterday, uh, is the vast number of other bits of legislation that are impacting uh, our industry. So it was good to see it coming in, in, in Prof. Eusta's uh, presentation, because we've already highlighted as something we need to help share to our members. It's not just Act 36, there's lots of other legislation. Uh, Sabu Kamalo um, restored my faith in interaction um, with people who we often think might be barriers to our trade or, or barriers to our industry. So our experience in the very recent past of, ex of expressing our concerns about the uh, EU notification of revoking certain MRLs for a couple of active ingredients, um, DTRC embraced us, listened to us, and took our message up to the European Union, and uh, Cebu gave us a great feedback on where we are there. The reason I'm highlighting that is going forward, we are going to have to engage with multiple role players in, in our industry 
to get our voice heard. And having DTRC as a valued partner there is going to be critical to us going forward. So great f um, uh, foundation has been set. Um, we're very pleased that Alan could jump on the plane and get down here because uh, you can all see from what's been discussed today, if we're not speaking one voice and we're not speaking to the right people, we're going to get nowhere. So advocacy is going to be key to us going forward. Uh, and we look forward to, to getting guidance from Alan. The key message there is we need collaboration. Again, it's a common theme. All role players need to be involved and we need to start now. So uh, we can't wait another two years to, to start looking at this, pretty much like we decided with the 1As and 1Bs. We can't wait any longer. We need to take some action ourselves. So we look forward to your guidance and collaboration there, Alan. Thank you. Then this final session chaired by, by Gerard and with our panelists um, is what's going to happen on the ground? Can we get some, some pointers or some feel as to, as to what's coming? Um, so I really appreciated the... Uh, the, uh, the overview that um, Kuba started in terms of what should an ideal spray, spray program have or a, a pest control um, uh, activity on the farm. It needs to be effective and uh, we, we, we ran, Kuba's ran through with us those key points. Also to illustrate the dangers of losing certain active ingredients, uh, Kuba uh, showed us a short list of, of 1B products and then did a deep dive into two of them. Uh, and that is exactly what the uh, working group, the 1A, 1B working group has been doing and exactly what the working group reached out to the various grower associations to continue the work. Have a look at the preliminary, preliminary list and I highlight it's preliminary. Um, not everyone has finished their GHS classifications yet, so uh, wait for the final work please. Don't, don't get yourselves worked up with what you saw, but it is exactly what we have been doing and it is exactly what we have to continue to do uh, to come up with our our scientific based data as to why we would need some of these uh, molecules to, to stay around. Paul then gave us a, a, an awesome presentation and the key for me was highlighting, Paul, that there are no trade policies or much legislation these days that don't have a political angle to it, which is, uh, which is concerning, but it also is going to help guide us going forward. Uh, we can't go in with the emotional fluffy feel that uh, we can't do without it. We have to go in and explain exactly why we can't do without an active ingredient. And Paul also highlighted a, another common factor that's been going through a few of the presentations this afternoon is decisions need to be based on sound scientific generated data. It cannot just be on emotions or because we want to, want to save the planet. Um, we get this all the time. I, we have a a misconception that people in the, in the agricultural industry don't care about the environment, but uh, I can tell you, like me, there's lots of us bunny huggers out there, so it is a perception that we also need to overcome with our strategy going forward. The panel discussion was interesting. Uh, um, no offence, I think we went off the Green Deal a little bit at the end, but it's very valuable points that, that we're all going to, we're all going to um, take to heart. But the, the key point that I did take from it is as we lose molecules and farmers are losing plant protection solutions, uh, there is the risk that they're going to start going off-label or unregistered products or products that haven't been tested or, or their own tank mixture because Uwem Paul next door tells them it works. So it's something as an industry, as a grower association, uh, our members are, are registration holders. We need to be cognizant so we could have that risk going forward. Then the conclusions from my side, again, Elmay, thank you for raising it. Uh, CropLife does not want to take ownership of this process. It does not belong to us. It belongs to all role players. However, we do believe we have some experience. We have expertise with uh, advocacy, and we certainly would like to play a facilitatory role. So anybody out there who wants to hold hands and walk with us, if you've got ideas that weren't shared today, you know who we are. So please either go through your grower association or come directly to us, share your ideas. And if you're willing to put in some hard graft as well, we, all, all, all comers will be certainly welcome. Um, there was also a question asked and, and Almay answered it. Um, yes, I agree. I think communications to growers is certainly going to be one of the responsibilities of the Crop Life Association. It's our members who are going to be motivating to keep some of these molecules on the market. Uh, and I do believe uh, in conjunction with grower associations, we need to reach out to, we need to, reach out to the farmers. 
Uh, and then finally, I would just like to extend our thanks to all of you, not only for being here today, uh, but for showing that um, uh, there was a reason for this, for this session to happen today. And I thank you in advance, because I'm hoping that you're all going to come up with some wonderful ideas that you can feed back into, into the creation of the strategy as to how we can approach the European Union uh, to try and get them to see uh, there could be some unintended consequences of their policies, and can we mitigate those potential unintended uh, consequences via interaction with them. Those of you who have hung in there and joined us virtually, we thank you for, for joining us today. And for those of you in the room, if you have the time, please join us for some refreshments and networking afterwards. Sincere thanks to all of you for joining us today. Thank you.